Okay, so um, you may have noticed from what it says on the board there that it, it's not talking about um, the new members class. Um, since our pastor is away, I decided it would be a good opportunity to do something a little bit different just for this week. And uh, particularly since uh, you may remember we did a few uh, years ago a four-year curriculum where we studied uh, theology and we looked at Bible survey and uh, then we spent a section on church history and then one on biblical thinking and how to apply um, all of those lessons that we learned in the rest of the curriculum in our daily lives. Now one of the benefits um, of having moved across to a new website is that we reviewed what we actually had of our four-year curriculum and uh, to the very best of my knowledge and uh, certainly Pastor Bryant's too um, we were never able to find that when we did Bible survey we had covered the book of Job not quite sure how that happened um, we spent uh, the second quarter of our second year on survey and we got all the way through to Esther and then we began the second quarter of our third year and we picked it up in the book of Psalms and Job seems to have dropped out of the mix somehow. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to uh, plug that gap in our four-year curriculum um, but obviously it's more than that and I hope that by the time we're finished this morning um, you'll have an appreciation for the book of Job, perhaps some new things will come out and um, your heart will be warmed and you'll be encouraged to uh, study this book uh, in your own devotions in more detail. Uh, first of all, though, let me ask um, a couple of questions about the whole idea of Bible survey. Um, why is it a good thing to do? You know, what we do in Bible survey is that we take a book, for example, we try and understand um, the history of that book, the circumstances in which it was written, something about the writer and uh, his life, and uh, then we can look at, in very broad and general terms, look at some of the main themes um, in that book. Why is, why is that a good thing? Um, for us to do. Jan? It helps us to understand God's story and the context of the context which was given to us. Okay, yeah, that's very important. It, it, it puts God's word into its context. There's an old uh, preaching Maxim, which says that a text without a context is a pretext. Um, and it's very important, uh, certainly when preaching, not to just take a verse out of its context and say, well, the Bible says this. Because uh, oftentimes you find that if you look back at the context in which that verse appears, it may not quite bear the weight that you're trying to place on it. Um, we shouldn't use the, the Bible like a series of, of coat pegs trying to find one that will hang, hang our particular message on um, but rather we need to understand it the full sweep of scripture and it's, it's good obviously to get into detail and to understand uh, the word of God in as much detail as we can but it's also good occasionally to get up uh, to the 30,000 foot level and look down and, and look at the landscape and uh, that's what we're doing in Bible survey. It's also good, of course, to be able to think, um, okay, Book of Romans, chapter 1, men are without excuse, chapter 2, Jews and Gentiles have a problem, chapter 3, there is no one righteous, chapter 4, even Abraham isn't righteous, chapter 5, and so on and so forth. Um, so that when we need to find something in the scriptures, if we have that foundation of survey laid, we can get into it much faster. Um, okay, given that that's, uh, those are the pluses of doing Bible survey, what do we need to watch out for? Are there any negatives 
when we start to read people's opinions on Bible authors and uh, historical contexts and all that stuff. Is there a problem? There certainly can be a lot of misinformation. You, you don't study this very long before you're into the realm of the textual critics. And as far as I can make out, uh, textual critics make a name for themselves by basically taking any particular book of the Bible and finding that it wasn't written by the person whose name appears on it. There are, in fact, three or four Isaiahs, they'll tell you. Um, uh, and uh, most, most books that say they were written by one author were never actually written by that person at all and they look at the style and the grammar and so on and they say well uh, with our superior education and knowledge we're now able to prove that these books are uh, not what they may appear to be at first sight um, and they neglect certain facts um, in the case of Isaiah, for example, he, he prophesied and wrote over, uh, I think, almost his entire life. Now, I don't write the same way today that I wrote when I was 18. Uh, if you compared my writing, I think they would be incredibly different. And you could let one of these textual critics loose on my writings and they'd say, clearly two different authors. Uh, well, no. One author in two different periods of life with different sets of experience to draw on. So we need to watch out for those critics and particularly the, the liberal ones who uh, want to make a name for themselves by espousing some new theory about uh, who wrote what and when these things happened. That's general background. Let's get into uh, the book of Job. Who wrote it and when? And uh, the answer to that, as far as I can make out, is a resounding, we don't know. Um, and those who've attempted to date it, it seems, have managed to come up with dates that are as far apart as 1,000 years. Now, once again, the critics come along and they see that uh, if you look at the prologue and the epilogue and the sections of the book that deal with Elihu um, and his interactions with Job, those are different in style, they say. And uh, clearly, therefore, are not part of the original, are not genuine. Um, but, uh, in fact, if you study this more closely, you'll find out that uh, there's no real reason to ascribe any or to, to credit those assertions with any sort of uh, merit whatsoever. Those things are quite readily answered by scholars and just from an appeal to what those particular parts of the book are attempting to achieve. What the book does tell us um, is where uh, Job lived. Anybody uh, able to tell us that? Probably if you've read your notes, you will be able to. Where does Job live during the account that, uh, that we have in this book? Jerry? Very good. Yeah, in the land of Uz or Uz, we have in Job 1.1, 1, 1, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that's his biography as far as uh, up to that point. That's all we need to know uh, about where he came from and what his name was. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Now, as, as Jerry said, us uh, is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, in Jeremiah and in Lamentations and... Uh, seems to have been a region to the east or the southeast of Canaan. Um, and so we know that much at least. Um, also, we are absolutely certain that Job was a real man, that he really lived, and uh, that the events that are described in this book 
really happened and uh, how can we be certain of that? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah? Other biblical authors described him as a real person. Right. Other biblical authors described him as a real person. Look at these texts here in Ezekiel. Uh, first verse, uh, chapter 14 and verse 13, where God is talking to Ezekiel. And he says this, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send famine against it, and cut off from it both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves declares the Lord. And then again in uh, verse 19 of that chapter. Or if I should send a plague against that country and pour out my wrath in blood on it to cut off man and beast from it, even though Noah, Daniel and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So um, fairly clear from that that the Lord God uh, is saying to us that Job is as real a character as Noah and Daniel. And then we come into the New Testament and uh, to James who writes this in chapter 5 and verse 11. <clears throat> we count those blessed who have endured you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So based on these scriptures I think we can be absolutely confident that this was a real man. Um, if anybody ever tries to say that uh, these events didn't really happen and there never really was a character called Job, then I think you can say, well, God believed that there was a character called Job as much as there was a character called Noah and Daniel. And James talks about the dealings that God had with this man and puts him forward as an example for us. So um, that's pretty solid and conclusive and I think we can rest uh, very confidently on that. Now that's something then by the way of background and of necessity I think with Job there's rather less than you might have for other books that, uh, that we could survey. Uh, but let's take a little look at the structure of the book and uh, this structure comes out of um, the book that we've used, at least when we were doing the high school class, I think the, the students in that class all received a copy of this, The Survey of the Bible by William Hendrickson, I think on our website um, under the four-year curriculum pages there is a link uh, that will take you to a place where you can obtain a copy. It is a good overview of uh, the books of the Bible. And this structure here is one of, I think, um, Hendrickson gives three structures in his uh, overview of Job, or rather he gives one structure but he gives it first in a very clipped down version and then slightly expanded and then um, the full feature length uh, structure. And this one is uh, the middle of those three. And the big question that is posed in this book of Job is this, why does a just God afflict God-fearing Job? And here is how uh, Hendrickson breaks out the structure of the book. The first two chapters, Job is introduced to us as a blameless man, uh, sacrificing on behalf of his sons and his daughters when they've had a time of feasting 
just in case they may have somehow sinned against God in that time. Um, and yet, uh, you have that scene where Satan appears before God and uh, God holds up Job as an example. Have you considered my servant Job and how blameless he is? And uh, you have that scene developing where uh, God allows Satan to strike his possessions and when that doesn't result in uh, Job turning against God, uh, God allows him actually to strike his flesh, but his life must be spared. And so you have this now sorely afflicted Job by the end of these chapters, I think, sitting in an ash heap with uh, running sores, scraping himself with bits of broken pottery in great pain, um, he's lost all of his possessions, he's lost his children, he's lost his health. Even his wife, who had, uh, I think, been a faithful partner up to this time, she gives up on God and she says, why don't you just curse God and die? And uh, he says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we receive good from the Lord and not evil? And in none of this does Job sin against God. In chapter 3 though, um, his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar come along, they sit with him, they're so appalled at what's happened to him that I think for a whole week they sit with him unable to say anything. And then Job does speak and he curses the day of his birth. He still is not blaming God but he curses the day of his birth. And that opens the way then uh, for uh, what takes the majority of this book, which is these discourses between one or other of the three friends, or counselors, and uh, Job. And they argue backwards and forwards. And the friends basically have one argument, or, well, uh, it, it, it appeals in a number of appears in a number of different ways, but their main argument is this: You must be a really wicked sinner, Job, for this to have happened to you, because it's the sinful people whom God afflicts in this way. Those who haven't helped the people who are in distress, um, and God is chastening you, so that if you respond to that chastening you might be restored. And in each of those uh, discourses, I think there are three cycles of them in these chapters, Job answers and says, firstly, I am not wicked but righteous. I know of no sin that would account for this sudden affliction from God. And secondly, if it's true that God always afflicts the wicked, then how is it that there are many wicked people who seem to prosper? How does that argument stand up? Um, in answer to the other assertions about the fact that he'd never helped anybody in distress, that was simply not true. He had always used his wealth, which was considerable, um, and considered and taken pity and had compassion on those who were in need and in distress. And lastly, uh, if it is a matter of chastening, does it have to be so grievous um, in order to achieve its results? And uh, Job becomes very tired of the perpetual and unchanging accusations of his friends and he rebukes them because they're no comfort to him. And uh, in the midst of that grief and that pain and that anguish he cries out that God may hear him and that he may have an opportunity uh, to make his case before God because he does not understand what is happening to him. Then um, along comes a fourth friend when the three counselors have nothing more to say along comes Elihu and uh, he rebukes everybody. He rebukes the three, the three friends because they're condemning Job 
but they have no answer to the defense that Job mounts against their accusations. And he rebukes Job because Job continues to justify himself and to proclaim his own righteousness. And that really takes um, a good portion of the book. And those of you who have read it may be wondering, well, how is this all going to end? Because they don't seem to be making a lot of progress here. And just as Elihu is uh, finishing his last discourse, you remember there's this sound of a thunderstorm which draws near and then God speaks to Job out of the storm and summons him to defend himself and to answer uh, God in this inquiry. And basically what God reveals to Job is that mere men cannot hope to understand the purposes of an infinite God and his dealings with uh, even the righteous. He basically uh, asks Job uh, if he could take the reins of the universe in his hands and govern everything with wisdom and with power as God does. Uh, and Job quickly realizes that he doesn't even have the understanding uh, to tackle a couple of the, the creatures that God has made, let alone uh, to go beyond that and uh, attempt to govern the entire universe. And so the message that is implied here is that because God is so great and so infinitely wise, man should not expect to understand him fully, but should trust him. Uh, that's a message that some of the cults, if not all of them, completely fail to understand. They expect to understand God. They reduce God into some kind of a pocket-sized entity that they can completely comprehend. All of his thoughts, all of his actions, all of his deeds, all of his character, all of his being. Um, but we can't. Uh, to me, one of the, uh, one of the marks that the Bible is the Word of God is the fact that I can't understand it all. That it's completely beyond, uh, at least parts of it, are completely beyond my ability to get my mind around it. Now wouldn't we expect that? If this is the communication of an infinite God using a finite language to finite and sin-corrupted beings, why would we expect to be able to understand it all? And so Job now has this revelation of God and uh, he utters these words, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And uh, he's brought into a much fuller understanding of God than he ever had before. And uh, in the end, of course, as James has already told us, God restores him, um, he prays for his counselors and they are healed also and then Job is greatly blessed, more so in the latter part of his life than he ever was at the beginning. So that's a, a quick overview of uh, the book of Job and I'll just pause there to see if that's raised any questions. I'm not guaranteeing to be able to answer them, but uh, certainly if there are any questions that you have, I'll, I'll see what I can do to help. Yes? Well, the comment is, of course, that to prove Job's a real person, uh, we went to other scriptures to demonstrate that. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely true. But I think you're opening up a much bigger question there, because um, Job 
from these scriptures is as real as Noah and as real as Daniel and is someone who's held up as an example for us. Now if we dismiss the entire scriptures and say well neither was Noah a real person, neither was Daniel a real person, Jesus wasn't a real person, um, then there is nothing left. Um, and you are dismissing uh, God's revelation of himself and his way of salvation. Um, so, uh, I mean in some cases I suppose you would argue we have more historical evidence. We can point to Ephesus and that there was a temple of Diana and so on and so forth and it's still there today. Um, the very nature of the book of Job is it's not based in buildings or structures, it's, we just know it happened in the land of us. Um, but beyond that, uh, there's no historical material that we can really pin a location on or, or anything else. That's why the people who've looked at this have even come up with a timing for the book that's as much as a thousand years separated. But you're right, I mean, if, if you begin with the premise that nothing in the Bible can be, be believed or trusted, then we can't demonstrate that Job is a real man. But we have bigger problems than that, if we, if we start at that point. Um, any other comments? Okay, well what I want to do for the rest of our time this morning is um, just to look at some of the themes, we've already touched on some of them in our outline, but I want to dig into it in a little bit more detail and just look at um, some of the remarkable verses that there are as you read through this book of Job. What seems to have happened to him, and I think why um, this book is so helpful to us when we go through times of difficulty and darkness and, and despair, of pain and suffering and of grief, uh, as Job certainly did, is that um, his experience can minister to us. His experience is, is, is one of, um, of terrible, terrible grief and pain, but in the midst of those things what we see is that he's sometimes almost taken out of himself and given these shafts of light just momentary. You see two or three verses where he understands something and he, and he says something that is so remarkable and so crystal clear and so full of conviction and faith and light um, that it's an amazing thing. And then the next moment he's back into his gloom and his, his darkness and his despair and I think that is uh, so accurate in terms of a, a diagnosis of, of ourselves when we have these difficult times. Uh, the Lord will come to us, he'll minister to us, he'll give us a moment of light and of comfort and then the next moment we, we, we sink again into the valley of tears and into uh, despondency. Um, but let's look at some of these verses and again um, I don't claim originality for this I, uh, many, many years ago now, for the price of 40 new pence in the United Kingdom, I picked up this book in a second-hand bookshop. Um, it was originally sold for five shillings, apparently. It's a book called The Answers of Jesus to Job. And it's written by a man called G. Campbell Morgan, who you may or may not have heard of. Um, he was, I think, the minister who preceded Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones at the Westminster Chapel um, in London. And uh, certainly in this book, um, he provides some real uh, insight and I think some very helpful uh, material. And we're going to work our way through that uh, now. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is this, what happens in Job chapter 9. Uh, which is a, a pretty amazing chapter and uh, it deals with the need for an arbiter. Here's Job at the beginning of the chapter, he's saying he knows that what Elias has and, and the other and Bildad and so on are saying is true to some extent, but then he says, but how can a man be in the right 
before God? Now there's a question. How can a man be in the right before God? And then the whole of his argument is how holy and righteous and infinite God is and in comparison what he is like and how if he ever managed to get before God um, he couldn't expect in the presence of one so pure and so infinite uh, to have a good reception and he, he comes to the point in verse 30 where he says if I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye yet you would plunge me into the pit and my own clothes would abhor me for he is not a man as I am that I may answer him that we may go to court together there is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both and there's this thing that Job's wrestling with I know what I'm like I, I can't see what I have done that has got me into this position as far as I can tell I was to the best of my ability leading a blameless life and suddenly all of this happens but I know what God is like how am I going to be able to, to come before such a God and make a case with him what I need and what I don't have is somebody who could stand between us somebody who could put his hand upon me as a man in the condition that I am in and put a hand upon God and function as a mediator, as a go-between and where can such a person be found? Now, Campbell Morgan leaves us thinking about that question where can somebody be found who can put a hand on God and a hand on man and mediate between them? And then he takes us into 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men the man Christ Jesus now here's some review for us from the last few weeks of our new members class Steve did you have a, a comment? there was no written word uh, it was Job phenomenal having to question God uh, how do we know that was it just from the created uh, how do you know God? Well, he was certainly a God-fearer. His whole life had been one in which he had worshipped God. Um, I'm not sure what kind of ministry was available, since we don't know exactly when it was that these events took place. He clearly, and, and his friends clearly have a knowledge of the righteousness and the holiness and the justice of God, and that God condemns the wicked and, and exalts the righteous and they didn't necessarily always interpret God's dealings as they might have done so there was a revelation of God we've seen, um, haven't we, that, that even out of general revelation you can, if you study God's creation intently and, and obviously with the help of His Spirit you can come to a considerable degree of knowledge about the power and the eternal character and nature of God um, but I think also some of these shafts of light have to have come to him um, as the Holy Spirit ministered to him in the midst of this darkness but the review for us from our new members class is this uh, why is Jesus so well equipped to be a mediator? Jan Right, because he is both fully God and fully man. If we need someone to be able to put his hand on God and on man and stand between them, what kind of a person do we need that to be? We need it to be somebody who is both God and man. Because a man is not going to be able to stand in the presence of such a God. The second thing that uh, Campbell Morgan takes us to is in Job 14 
um, the inquiry as to life, Campbell Morgan calls it. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle I will wait until my change comes. And uh, once again, Job is in gloom and despondency. And if, if you look at chapter 14, you'll see him pondering at the beginning of that chapter from verse 7 onwards that there seems to be more hope for a tree to live again than for a man. And, and that's one of the things about this book, it's very honest. It doesn't try and conceal some of these very, very basic and, and, and heart-rending things that were going on in, in Job's mind and in his heart. And he's saying here, if only there was some certainty of resurrection, of a life to come, then that would make these trials and these difficulties so much more tolerable, so much more uh, endurable. He would wait out the trials as difficult and as painful as they are and look for better things to come. Uh, but certainly at this particular point he doesn't receive an answer to that. Um, and then, of course, Jesus comes in, uh, in that passage, the account of the death of Lazarus, and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. This is the answer of, of Jesus to that question of Job. If a man dies, will he live again? Because that would make a huge difference to the way that I endure and deal with the things that happen here on earth, wouldn't it? And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and if uh, somebody believes in me, he will live even though he dies. There is a life to come. And for those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a glorious life. It is life indeed. What we have here is a kind of shadow of it. Because eternal life is to know God and to know the Lord Jesus Christ whom he sent. And we will know him in heaven uh, far better than we know him here and now. So that is really living. What we are doing here is living in a realm of shadows and looking forward to that reality. Campbell Morgan gives a quote from D.L. Moody about this. D.L. Moody apparently said this, Some fine morning you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't you believe it? I shall be more alive that morning than ever before. And uh, I'm not sure that we in this day and age tend to look at things so much that way, but we should. Um, we shouldn't make all of our life here. Um, but this is just a preparation ground for what lies ahead. Now, the witness in heaven even now, says Job in chapter 16 and verse 19, Behold, my witness is in heaven, and my advocate is on high. This is in this second round of, of debate backwards and forwards between Job and his uh, so-called friends or counselors. And what Job is doing here is crying out, he has a sense that there is one who understands. He has a witness in heaven who regards what is going on, who understands it. He has an advocate in heaven, but not one whom he can sense with him now, one whom he can reach, one who he thinks is, is with him in the midst of this distress. But yet he feels that perhaps his only hope to escape from 
these human judgments of his friends who are coming out and saying, well, it's because you sinned, isn't it? And there's a whole series of peanut cartoons where, where I think Schultz takes up that theme and one of the people says, well, it's because you sinned, it's because you're really bad. And they're being very much like Job's counsellors. <clears throat> and Job knows they're wrong. He knows their arguments are, are wrong and he knows there is somebody who understands that and knows what the correct arguments are, which he doesn't understand himself, but how to get to him. How can that happen? Uh, well, Campbell Morgan points us to Hebrews 9.24 For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We have one who understands us through and through. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. We have one who has lived our life. We have one who has died our death. We have one who has risen into heaven and one who on the basis of an indestructible life ever lives to intercede for us. He is even now in the presence of God. We can pin all of our hopes for a sympathetic uh, an understanding uh, reception, as it were, on Him. We have that Advocate, we know who He is, and we know that He does understand and that He is able uh, uh, to intercede for us and to save us to the uttermost because of His everlasting life. Well now the Living Redeemer uh, we sang this as we began. And this, uh, you know, to, to Steve's point, this I think is one of the most remarkable things of many amazing things that Job says in the midst of his distress. Here it is. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Now this one is not just a witness and an advocate. Now he is the Redeemer. And uh, the word there, I understand, is this word goel, uh, which if you've looked at the book of Ruth, you'll know it means a kinsman redeemer. They had this system in the Old Testament where somebody who was the next of kin was obliged to take care of, of his brother's wife if, if, uh, if the brother passed away. He was obliged to step in and to redeem the property and to take it to himself and to pass the name of the dead man on through any children that may be born as a result of that union. And he is the Goel, the, the, the next of kin who has the responsibility to redeem in that way. And of course Christ is our Goel. He is the one who became our kinsman when he uh, became flesh. And uh, redeemed us to God and from our sin. But what is Job actually saying here when he says, I am going to see this Redeemer in my flesh. Even after my skin is destroyed, my eyes are going to see him. What's Job looking forward to? Let me ask you the question, if you're a believer this morning, will your eyes, physical eyes, 
see the Lord Jesus Christ. When? Yes? At the resurrection. And that's an amazing thought for us. Um, but here is Job, it seems, looking forward to that time. I am going to see him. My Redeemer. What does a Redeemer do? We've, we've already talked about it a little bit. What does redemption mean? To buy back. Yeah, if, you, if you've gone into a, a pawn shop and you've made something over in exchange for money, then when you go back and you have to give more money, um, you redeem it. You buy it back to yourself. Now, here is redemption. My Redeemer lives. At the last, he will take his stand on earth. Has the Redeemer taken his stand on earth? Has he stood here? Has Jesus stood here on earth? Seems to be a little bit of confusion <laughs> about that. When did he do that? Two thousand years ago. Two thousand years ago. He took human flesh. He became our kinsman in order to be our redeemer. And then, of course, he was uh, killed upon the cross, buried, rose again and ascended and even now is in heaven. So, Job, in just the few short words here, has spelled out for us, it seems, redemption incarnation and resurrection and in these most glorious words it's no wonder that Handel looked at these when he was thinking of the Messiah I know that my Redeemer lives and what a cry of conviction when we go through difficulties and pain and suffering and grief what a, what a comfort to us to be able to echo these words with conviction I know that my Redeemer lives and that I will see him with these eyes glorified at the resurrection. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he's able to also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Our kinsman redeemer has represented us below and now he ever lives to represent us in heaven above. Well then we turn again to, to Job in a time of his, his darkness and his questioning and he's seeking out for God. Oh, he says in chapter 23 and verse 3, Oh that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. Uh, again, he knows that God has answers for him to a, to a situation that he cannot begin to understand. Why has this happened to me? Um, how has this taken place? But at the moment, God is hidden to him. Uh, and although he knows that God is there, and uh, nothing has shaken him out of that conviction, he cannot perceive God. Well, how does Jesus answer that question for us? Well, he does uh, in John 14, verse 9. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And Philip, in the midst of one of these discussions with Jesus, had said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. And Jesus says, well, you know, I've been with you now all this time. You've seen the things that I've done. You've heard the things that I have taught. You have witnessed the life that I have lived. And if you have seen those things, 
then you have seen the Father. And so, for us, when we are not sure, you know, oh, you know, where is God in the midst of all this? Um, we too can turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and see God in him, something that Job was not able to do so well. <clears throat> the challenge to God. Chapter 31, verse 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. And the indictment which my adversary has, has written, surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it to myself like a crown. Job has got his defense prepared. He knows exactly what he wants to say. He's had plenty of time. He's got it all laid out, even as a legal document. And he's put his signature on it and said, that's it. That's my defense. But now I need someone to hear my case. And I don't know where he is. And I don't know what his case against me is. I've never understood that. Um, and I don't really care anymore for these three friends and, and for their repetitions of arguments that just don't resonate and that, that, that aren't true. There's got to be something to account for what I'm going through. But I don't know what it is. And I want my day in court, is what he's saying, but I don't know how to get there. I want somebody to hear my defense and I want to know what the charges are against me. And again we turn to Hebrews 12:22. You have come not to <coughs> mount uh, that the mount of the law um, Sinai and to the city of, but you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So there is Job looking to have his case heard. He doesn't know how to get there. And here in Christ, we have come to this place that is called the joy of the whole earth. We have come before God, the judge of all. We know in Christ that all the charges against us are dismissed. We've been declared not guilty. And we have Christ there as our mediator whose blood is uh, always crying out for our pardon and for mercy. That is how Christ answers this felt need that Job had. I've got a defense, but I don't know how to make it. I don't know how to, to, to bring it to God, and I don't know what his charges against me are. Um, but here it is. This is what I want to, to challenge God with. And, and if you like to prove me wrong and to show me the reason for all this suffering. Well then you move into the time when God does actually reveal himself. And uh, he just speaks to God out of the storm and begins to unfold his character. He doesn't ever in this book tell Job why this suffering came upon him. Not once. But he just begins to reveal himself in his majesty and his power to Job. And in a way that Job had, had been unaware of up to this time. And Job beholds it and says, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Job realizes he is nothing in the presence of a God like this? How could all of his protestations of innocence and self-righteousness ever have come forth from his lips? 
he lays his hand on his mouth and he says I am nothing now here is uh, something I think that's very interesting to ponder because he's right in one sense uh, we are all, none of us is, is anything in comparison with God and it's right that we should have that view of ourselves and should humble ourselves before one who is infinite and majestic and glorious but look at these verses from the Gospels. Matthew 16, 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What are we being invited to do there? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What's the underlying question? Jerry? Yeah, a little bit. That's the start of it. Don't look to earthly things. Is the more to it? What what things are being held up for comparison? A soul. A soul on the one hand, yeah, and. Possessions, the whole world, in fact. Okay, what's worth more? What's the implication? What's worth more, a soul or the whole world? So, in answer to the the correct understanding that Job now has of his insignificance in front of God, here we still have this fact that a single soul is worth more than the world and that if you give your soul and gain the world in exchange for it you've made a bad bargain for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life Job is right in one sense um, he is insignificant he is nothing in the presence of this God but God shows us something a little different and Campbell Morgan points to that scripture I think it's Psalm 8 when I consider the heavens the work of your hands all that splendor and majesty what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him well what's, what's he saying you do care for man you are mindful of the Son of Man notwithstanding what we are you are mindful of us and notwithstanding the wickedness and corruption of sin in this world God set his love on his people before the world began and sent his Son to redeem them and so that is uh, an answer that Jesus gives to this right perspective that Job now has but it's a, a modifier on it the discovery of God Job says I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eye sees you therefore I retract and repent in dust and ashes God has asked Job are you going to condemn me in order to justify yourself if you think you can do that Job then here are the reins of the universe take them up, govern the universe and see how you get on and do it first Job in the moral realm in putting down the proud, in lifting up the humble, in deciding right and wrong, do it there and then come into the non-moral realm and Job now realizes whom it is that he is dealing with and he declares his repentance his eyes have now seen God now he has a better understanding not of why it is that God in his mysterious purposes has put Job through this uh, ordeal but 
that he is a God of infinite wisdom and power and majesty who governs all things according to his own purposes and that's enough to trust in that and he repents of it and submits to God's right to do as he wills with the things that he has made acknowledging that what he wills is good and right and Jesus in his preaching of the gospel points to the same way for us uh, a submission to God, a repentance, a turning away from our sin and a trusting in God and in his purposes lastly the sense of solution and we go back a little bit in the book of Job here just to round it out where he says in Job 23 10 he knows the way I take and when he has tried me I shall come forth as gold it's another of those shafts of light that comes through to him he understands this isn't going to be the end this is working out something good this is to refine this is to clear out the dross and when it is over I will come forth as gold you know that hymn uh, God moves in a mysterious way and it talks about behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face and that is always the case for the children of God things don't always pan out the way we would like them to sometimes things happen to us we can't, can't begin to understand and they are intensely painful but God knows what he is doing he is his own interpreter and what he is doing is right and when he has refined us we will all all who are his children come forth as gold James says in chapter 1 verse 12 blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him so I have to say I found this study personally very encouraging um, to get a, a deeper look into the book of Job and also to see how intensely practical it is and how useful for us uh, living our lives as believers when we go through these times of difficulty and trial and, and hardship and affliction um, to see how uh, Job went through the same things raised some of the same questions that come to our hearts not all of them right questions but they are honestly recorded for us um, and yet to see how the Lord Jesus Christ so fully and completely meets our need at every point um, when we go through those times now we're out of time if there's a, a brief question I can take probably one um, otherwise we'll get ready for worship okay well let's pray together